everyone thanks for visiting my channel if you're new here welcome I'm Carol the thrifty chic housewife so today we are going to be talking about the basics of canning just the basic stuff kind of an overview many of you have shared with me that you're new to canning or that you want to try canning and so I thought it would be a good time to just do a nice basic video just I'm kind of introducing you to canning and the things that you need, the differences in the different types of canning, and that kind of thing, and kind of answer some questions that are commonly asked so that those of you who are kind of in the afraid category, especially as it relates to pressure canning, um, I can kind of alleviate those fears and put those fears to rest for you. So this will be the first of three videos I'm going to do. Today is just going to be a short and sweet basics kind of thing. Then I'm going to do a video on pressure canning. I'm going to make that one my second video because I know several of you have ordered canners, but you're kind of hesitant to use them. So I thought time was of the essence for that for you. So I'm going to get that uploaded this week as well. And then I will also do a video on um, water bath and steam canning. Both water bath and steam canning have the uh, same rules, principles, if you will. So um, that video will be those two together. And I'll talk about steam canning. Steam canning's kind of new. Research was been done recently that gave us the okay to start steam canning. And I have fallen in love with steam canning. I started last year and I don't think I've done any water bath canning since. So that will be coming up as well. But today, let's just talk about canning. In general, and uh, first I want to say that I love canning. When I first started getting into canning, I had no idea I would enjoy it so much. Um, many people ask me, um, do you do it because you save money? Well, if you plan well, you can save money. If you can things that are in season and you use your farmer's markets or if you grow your own food in a garden, certainly you can save money, but that's not my main objective with canning. For me, canning is about, first of all, it's a wonderful hobby and I just thoroughly enjoy it. Um, but secondly, I know what's going in my food and um, it's kind of a labor of love. Um, for my family and friends. I love to share and I love have I love the idea of putting something homemade inside of a jar and being able to preserve that. And it was funny the other day my daughter had grabbed a can of peaches off of the shelf and she looked at the date and she said, you know, it really is amazing that we can eat something that was not made recently um, and you can put it in a jar and it's still beautiful and still delicious to eat so it is a fascinating in my opinion thing to be able to do at home i'm always fascinated when i look at my jars and see the delicious food that is inside of them i think it's really fabulous that we have the knowledge to be able to do that so those are my reasons for canning everyone has different reasons for doing it but like i said it truly is a very rewarding hobby so first of all i want to say that there's a lot of misinformation out there do not just use the internet as your source of what's safe and what's not safe for canning first and foremost safety is the most important thing in canning so always use trusted resources which would be the national center for home food preservation ball fresh preserving or books that are written by master certified certified master food preservers. There are a lot of canning books out there and a lot of people put things out on the internet and there are things that are not safe. So I highly encourage you to understand the methods of canning and what's safe and what's not. That is not to say you have to be a rocket scientist to do canning, you do not, but there are rules and guidelines that you should follow so that you can have, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what's inside of your jar is safe. So that's the first thing. Safety should be the first thing in your mind. So you really need to take the time to familiarize yourself with the ins and outs and the rules and guidelines of canning. I think that that is very, very important. There are three types of canning that are approved by the FDA as being safe. So pressure canning is for foods that are low in acid and that would include meats, vegetables, and um, dried beans. The second type of canning that is safe is water bath canning. And this is the type of canning that most people are familiar with. Um, and water bath canning is for foods that are high in acid. So that would include jams and jellies, fruits, 
um, and acidified foods like pickles and tomatoes also are water bath canned, but they should have acid added to them. The third type of canning is steam canning. And like I said, it is relatively new, um, approved newly approved, I guess I should say, um, as safe for doing at home. And it uses steam as the method of preserving your food. And steam canning is also approved only for high acid foods. Same rules apply to steam canning that apply to water bath canning. So it would be your fruits, jams, jellies, pickles, those kinds of things. Um, but steam canning I love because it uses a lot less water than boiling than a boiling water bath canner does. So those are the three types of canning that are safe for home use. Open kettle canning, inversion canning, dry canning in, a, in, in an oven. Some people use their dishwasher, um, microwave. None of that is safe. So please just don't, don't go there. There are only three types that I just mentioned that are safe. Anything else anyone tries to convince you of is not approved as safe for preserving food at, food at home. So please just don't do it. Um, it's just not a good idea. Okay, so for canning, you're gonna need a few things. Depending on what type of canning you're gonna be doing, obviously you need a canner. Uh, you're either gonna need a pressure canner or a water bath canner. My water bath canner is also a steam canner, but there are standalone steam canners. So you, you need a canner. And then you're also going to need some jars. Jars come in various sizes. Um, Jelly jars come in eight ounce and the four ounce little baby guys. You've got pint jars and in pint jars and quart jars, you have a regular mouth jar and then you also have a wide mouth jar. Uh, both are great wide mouth jars. I tend to gravitate toward wide mouth jars more than regular mouth jars. They're just easier to get things in and out of um, and, I, and I really enjoy that. You use the same size lid for both pints and quarts so it's nice to just have to deal with one type of lid that way but there are two sizes, um, two different styles in pints um, and then of course your quart jars. Again, regular mouth and wide mouth. There are half gallon jars, but half gallon jars are only approved for preserving um, fruit juices very high in acid. Um, so you really have to be careful with those. I think it's only grape juice and apple juice that they are approved for. Plus they're pretty big, so you'd have to, you need to have a pretty good size canner to even use them. So um, they're not used very often, but they are out there. But again, just for, sorry, that's the coffee pot, <laughs> just for um, those two types of juices. So you have those and then they have, I love ball makes decorative jars. You have these twisted jars are beautiful. These are pint, they also come in quart size. And then these are a new one by ball. This is called a flute jar. And it has a regular size mouth. Um, these are also regular mouth. They're not the wide mouth, but they are very pretty. So they're great for canning things up that you're going to give away. So the other thing, uh, aside from your jars, um, I do, I wanna say that with your jars, you wanna make sure that you check them each time you use them, even if they're new. Always run your finger around the rim and kind of on the inside, make sure there aren't any cracks or chips in them. Um, that could prevent them from sealing or get glass getting in your food. You don't ever want to use a jar that's damaged in any way. So make sure you check that each and every time that you can. And then the other thing that you're going to need obviously are lids. Now the most common type of lids are the two, the two part metal lids. This is a wide mouth and this is a regular mouth. Um, I gravitate towards these. I, I like ball products. Kerr also makes them. I'm sure there are other companies out there that make them. Um, there are also Tatler lids out there. Those can be reused, but they include a gasket and the method of using them is a little bit different. I do believe you tighten the bands after, um, you've done your processing. I don't use those. Um, there are some people who use them and love them. I like 
the two-piece metal lids so it's up to you what kind you want to use um, I feel very comfortable with these and I trust ball products so this is my go-to this is what you'll see in all of my videos um, tattler lids if you want some instruction on using those Linda from Linda's pantry she does use them and she would be a great resource for you I would just highly recommend that you read all the instructions that come with them before you use them and make sure you understand the what um, make sure you understand what you have to do to use them properly because I know it's a little bit different than the metal um, bands and lids the other lid that they have but this is not for canning but so I I'm sure everyone would know that, but I just want to point that out. Ball does make these plastic lids. These are just for storage, so they're great it, after you open something. You don't have to keep the metal ones on there if you don't want to. These are just plastic. They're really nice. They come in wide and regular mouth, and they're great for storing your jars, like jams and jellies. After you open them, they're great for storing in the fridge. So there are those, but these are not canning lids. Jars and lids as far as sterilizing. Guidelines now state years ago you had to always pre-sterilize your jars and lids. That is no longer true if you are going to be canning for 10 minutes or more in, in either of the three ways. It doesn't matter. Um, it's true for steam canning, water bath canning, and pressure canning. If your processing time is 10 minutes or more, you do not need to pre-sterilize them. Uh, just make sure you wash them really well and make sure you rinse them really well. Any soapy residue left in your lids will, can make your food taste kind of weird. So make sure that you get rid of any residue, no soap or anything left inside of them. Make sure you rinse them really, really well. As far as the lids are concerned, um, the makers of the ball and the cur lids. Ball came out a few years ago and said that you do not need to um, simmer these. It used to be you had to simmer your lids. They have changed the seal, so you no longer have to do that. But the same thing, make sure they're squeaky clean and well, well rinsed and you do not need to keep them hot. Um, your jars, before you fill them, they should be kept hot. So. I, if you watch my videos, you see me do this a million times. I wash my jars and lids and then I keep my jars hot in my sink filled with hot water. Some people use their dishwasher. Um, there's different ways of doing it, but you should always start with a hot jar. And then other equipment that you might need, not that you might need, other equipment that you will need is a jar lifter. You'll need a funnel. And then you will also need um, a pair of tongs to take your jars. If you keep them hot in hot water, you'll need your tongs to remove them. And then a debubbling tool. I love this tool and I highly recommend that you get one of these. They're not expensive at all, but they're wonderful to have. This end is used for debubbling, which is um, what we call releasing air bubbles from your jar. And then the other end has measurements to help you measure your head space. So this is a fantastic tool. If you do not have one of these, no worries. You can still use a plastic butter knife. You can also use a chopstick. So that's really pretty much what you need. And then you need a good tested recipe and your ingredients and you are good to go. Okay, now when you once you have a tested recipe and you're ready to can, one of the things that is gonna be discussed in the recipe is hot packing or raw packing. So let's talk about the difference between hot packing and raw packing. Hot packing is when you put hot food into a hot jar. Raw packing is when you put raw food into a still hot jar and you process that way. The difference, um, some of the issues that you can find in a recipe, it will tell you in the recipe if you should hot pack or if you have the option to raw pack. Um, raw packing is easier in my opinion, um, but most things are hot packed. Um, the disadvantage to raw packing foods is that they will often float in the jars and the air trapped in and around the food may cause some discoloration within two to three months of storage. Hot packing helps remove air from the inside of the food tissue, shrinks the food, and helps keep the food from floating in the jars. Frequently you will see um, floating with fruit. Um, you'll see that, that it likes to raise to the top if you... Um, raw pack it. Pre-shrinking that occurs in hot packing allows more food to fit in each jar. So 
there are advantages to hot packing versus raw packing, but that's the difference. Okay, and just some a few general guidelines. They highly recommend that you always use a tested recipe from a trusted source. The trusted sources, when we say that, we mean extension offices, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, the USDA, um, Ball Fresh Preserving, their recipes are tested. And then canning books that are written usually by master food preservers, they are using recipes that have been tested. So just make sure of that. Like I said at the beginning of my video, there are a lot of canning books out there I found out the hard way with recipes in them that are not tested. So especially as a new person, I would make sure that whatever, I would make sure I always use a trusted source. So always use a ball canning book, um, use like I said, the National Center for Home Food Preservation or Extension Offices, they all have great recipes. Ball has several canning books out. And then the other book that I wanted to mention that I love, especially for beginners, is um, it's called the Amish Canning Book. It's by Georgia Varosa. She is a certified master food preserver, and I have used this book extensively. As you can tell, I have all kinds of things marked in it. It's very well loved. She has a ton of wonderful information in here. I think especially for new people, um, she talks about some things that I've never found in the ball canning books. So as a new person, I highly, highly recommend that you get this book and you read you read it from cover to cover, not just the recipes, but the how to's. And she talks about the things that could go wrong and possible problems. Lots and lots and lots of wonderful information are in this book. So this would be my go-to that I would highly recommend for you to have. Um, so always start with a tested recipe. Use mason jars because they can withstand higher temperatures of a pressure canner better than single use jars. Um, some people like to reuse jars that you got from, got a jam or jelly in from the grocery store. If I know that people use them if they have a lid that will fit on them. I don't recommend doing that. They don't recommend doing that. Um, that's, so that's what they're referring to as far as a single use jar. Another thing, and I just talked about this um, when I was discussing jars, make sure you preheat your jars in the dishwasher or simmering water prior to filling them. Do not heat jars in your oven. Some people want to um, bake in canning jars and that is really a no-no. Ball has stated on their website that their jars are not made for baking in. I know there are recipes all over Pinterest and all over the internet where people are doing that and that is not safe. So do not heat them in your oven. Um, and to that same thing, you cannot can cake and desserts and stuff in the oven in a mason jar. I know there are recipes out there that do that, but that's not safe, so don't do that. Uh, make sure you use proper headspace. Headspace refers to the amount of space that is in a jar above um, the product that you are canning. So just as a reference, usually this this bottom lip right here, this bottom band, that's about an inch. The middle of it is about a half of an inch and then a quarter of an, an inch is this right here. And you can test that by using this guy. If you put that in your jar, you can see. And it will help you measure your headspace. The reason why headspace is important, couple of things. Too much headspace results in a lower vacuum and a weak seal. Too little headspace may force food under the lid and cause siphoning or breaking of the seal. Siphoning refers to liquid loss during the canning process. So your headspace is important. So always make sure that you follow the headspace that is given for whatever it is that you're canning. It's important. Um, proper headspace, just as an FYI, it's a quarter of an inch for juices, jams, and jellies, a half of an inch for fruits, tomatoes, and pickles, and one to one and a half inches for meats and vegetables. That's Those are standard. The next thing is to make sure you always remove air bubbles with a plastic utensil. 
wipe the edge of the jar with a damp paper towel. I always use a damp paper towel dipped in vinegar, white vinegar, to make sure I get my rim really, really clean. You don't have to use a paper towel. You can use a dishcloth if you prefer. Um, use two-piece lids. We talked about that. Only tighten lids fingertip tight. When we talk about fingertip tight, what we're talking about is after you put your food in your jar, you're going to add your lid and then you're going to take your band and you're going to screw it on just until you feel, feel resistance. You don't want to go past that. You don't want to screw it on too tight because that can be a, cause a problem with your seal and you don't want it to be loose. That can cause a problem with your seal. So when we say fingertip tight, we mean to tighten it until you feel some resi until you feel resistance. I shouldn't say some resistance until you feel resistance. Just don't go past that. So that's the deal on that. Um, use a jar lifter to place jars into the canner and to remove jars and be careful not to tilt them. So what we're talking about with that is once you have your lid on, you're always going to use your jar lifter to put it in the canner to take it out of the canner and you don't want to tilt it either way. Many times you will have a little bit of liquid on top of your jar and it's very natural to want to remove it by doing this and getting it to slide off. Don't do that. That could interfere with your seal and cause problems. Not to mention if it's you've got hot stuff going on in there. If you do that and your lid has not sealed, it could come out and you could potentially get burned. So don't tilt your jars. Um, always process according to the boiling water bath atmospheric steam canning or pressure canning procedures. Adjust processing times or pressure for altitudes that are above a thousand feet. This is really important, you guys. It's really important for you to know what your altitude is. Altitude will determine your processing time and what adjustments you need to make. So it's easy to find out. All you have to do is Google your city and state and Google will tell you what your altitude is. You can find that information in other places, but for me, that's the easiest thing to do. And then you need to um, go to one of our trusty books that I shared. Ball Canning has the adjustment tables in theirs. Um, the Amish Canning book has adjustment instructions in her book. Um, you can find adjustment instructions on the National Center for Home Food Preservation, and you can also find adjustment instructions at any of the extension offices. So make sure you know your altitude and then find out what adjustments that you need to make. After processing, set your jars at least two inches apart to cool on a wooden cutting board or on a towel lined surface. I usually just use a kitchen towel and put it on my counter. If you don't do that, you run the risk of your jars breaking. They're super duper hot when they come out of the canner. And if you set them on like my, I have granite, it's cold, you will cause um, shock to your jar and it could potentially break. And we don't want that. So always line your surface with a towel or use a wooden cutting board. Once you set them out, you do not want to retighten your bands. This is really, really important. The exception to that is Tatler lids. Those work differently. So this is referring to the metal lids um, and bands. Tatler lids have different instructions. So if you're using those, please follow the instructions that come with the Tatler lids. Um, but you don't want to retighten your bands. Once you take your jars out of the canner, just leave them alone and do not turn jars upside down. That kind of goes without saying that you, sh you shouldn't do that for a multitude of reasons. So th those are your basic guidelines. Those are the basic things that you want to keep in mind. Um, for Okay, once your canning session is over and you have set your jars out to cool, the instructions are for them to cool for 12 to 24 hours and then to check your seals. That is true, but I like to check my jars and I would highly encourage you as well. About an hour to two hours after you've taken them out of the canner, just take your, as soon as they've cooled enough for you to touch the lid, just touch the lid and see if it flexes up and down. And I just go down my row of jars and just push it. If that metal lid is still flexing, that means it's not sealed. And at that point, I would put it in the refrigerator and refrigerate it so that my food doesn't go bad. And then you would 
continue to let your jars cool and check your seals again 12 to 24 hours later when you're ready to put them away. The reason is there are times, you can have times where something may not seal and if you don't find out until 12 or 24 hours later, then you're just gonna have to toss that food. Um, the, the guideline in that is not really clear. I was just discussing this with a friend of mine who is a certified master food preserver. They just say to wait the 12 to 24 hours and then check your seals. Well, I don't want to eat something that's been sitting on a counter for 24 hours and is not sealed. To me, that's not safe. So I always check mine within two hours of them being taken out of the canner just to make sure that that lid is not flexing. Your other option, if it is flexing and you have several jars, you can always reprocess. I'm not a fan of that. I've done that before when I've had a problem and I don't have problems very often. It is very rare that I do not have seal, my jars do not seal properly. But one time that happened, I reprocessed and the food is just, you do, there is some loss of quality when you reprocess. So I don't really recommend that. I recommend you just take the jar, put it in the fridge and eat it within a couple of days of having processed the food. Um, so anyway, you're gonna let your jar sit for 12 to 24 hours. And then after 12 to 24 hours, you are going to remove, use this as an example. You're gonna remove your band. So you would take the band off, check to make sure that it is sealed, and then you should be able to lift the jar by the lid, and that should stay sealed. That tells you that you have a good seal. So don't be afraid after the 12 to 24 hours, don't be afraid to move your jars around. That, that seal should not open until you open it. Um, so I always go through each jar and I pick it up by the lid and make sure that it's sealed. That is important. Okay, as far as your seals go, I just wanted to bring you in close and show you what to look for when you go to take a jar off the shelf before you open it to eat it. Always make sure you do the test again, make sure your seal is intact, and you should hear it pop when you open it. So that's how you know that you have a good seal and that the food inside is safe to eat. Once you've determined that all of your jars have sealed and everything is good, you remove your bands, then give them a good wash. I like to use dish soap and with a little bit of white vinegar mixed in and I thoroughly wash my jars. I stick them in the sink and uh, wash them real good, rinse them real well, and then you're going to want to label them with the date and what's in them and then store them in a cool, dark, dry place. Um, as far as storage goes, um, they recommend storing them between 50 and 70 degrees. Normal room temperature is totally fine. I, we store ours in the basement and our basement is heated and air conditioned. So um, it's just room temperature and they store quite well. Things that you want to avoid is sunlight can degrade the food in your jars, so try to avoid that if you can. If you do not have a dark place, they also have what's called um, jar boxes that are made specifically for storing mason jars, and that helps to filter out the UV light. Okay, food spoilage. Spurting liquid when you open the jar. Your jar should not spurt anything when you open it. Um, that indicates pressure. Gas bubbles indicate pressure. Soft, mushy, slimy, fermented, or molded food, a fuzzy growth on top of the food, cloudy liquid, sediment, sediment in the liquid, leaking jars, broken or bulging seal, seals, or an off color or, or odor. They do not recommend, if you see any of that, they don't recommend tasting it, they recommend just pitching it. Food poisoning is a really, is a, is a real thing, obviously. Um, so you need to look for those signs of spoilage. Again, that does not happen very often. It's pretty rare. If you follow all the guidelines in canning, um, that should be very rare that you encounter something like that. But if you do, you want to just dispose of the food. Ways to prevent spoiling. Use top quality produce that is free of disease and mold. So canning is not a way of preserving food that is almost gone bad. Um, some people like to do that, but that is not what canning is for. You should always can with the highest quality food that you can get your hands on. So if you have a garden, as soon as you pick it, you should can it up and process it as soon as possible. 
The second point that they're making is can immediately after harvest. Third, make sure you wash your produce thoroughly. Discard any overripe produce. Always use proper canning methods and equipment. Use clean equipment and work surfaces. Be sure to sterilize jars that will be processed less than 10 minutes. Pressure low acid vegetables and meats. Make sure you acidify tomatoes. Follow a scientifically tested recipe and process for the specified time. Don't make things up. Adjust time and pressure for higher altitudes. Doing those things, you if you follow the guidelines and you do these things, you should not have any troubles whatsoever. But that leads me to a good point. I know a lot of you have reservations about canning because of the potential of making someone sick. I want to put that fear to rest. That's really important to me because that is that is not going to happen if you follow your guidelines to the T and you um, know how to use your canner and you follow all proper processes and procedures. And really canning is just a step-by-step -step thing. If you can read instructions, you can can. If you can read and follow instructions, you can safely can. And I think that that is an important point to make. Um, I, you, I don't want you to be afraid of canning. I really want to put your fears to rest on that. It's very rare that something goes wrong or that you will make someone sick as long as you are following all correct processes and procedures and you're using fresh food and you're clean. Your area is clean. Um, so you should not have any issues and you just try to put that fear to rest and don't let that deter you from becoming a canner. Um, a couple things that I want to cover that are questions that come up from time to time. Um, and I've gotten this one several times. Do you have to heat your food when you open a jar for it to be safe to eat? Years ago, they did say you should boil your food for 10 minutes before you eat it after you open a jar. But that is no longer true. As long as you are following modern canning guidelines and you are canning for the specified amount of time that is required for what's in your jar, you do not have to boil or preheat your food from your jar in any way. Another thing that you need to be aware of, and not a lot of people talk about this, is something called flat sour. And I talked about this in my last canning video. It was a Q&A that I did. Flat sour happens when after you um, process your food and you let your jars sit in that hot water for too long, um, then it develops some bacteria that causes just what it says, a flat and sour smell and flavor. And you don't want that. So always, once you always follow correct guidelines and you won't have that problem. Once your canning time is up, there are different processes for pressure canning and water bath canning and I'll go over that. If you wait the amount of time that they say before you remove your lid, let your jars sit for the correct amount of time for um, Water bath canning is waiting five minutes. For pressure canning, you're supposed to let your jars sit for 10 minutes and then remove them. If you wait for those times, you that won't happen. And even if you let your jars sit a little bit beyond that, just don't let them sit for a prolonged period of time in your canner without removing them. And that will prevent flat sour from happening. Um, another common question is how long can I keep my canned goods? Ball states that they guarantee their lids to stay sealed for 18 months. Most of the experts will tell you for best quality you should consume your food within a year of canning it. I keep mine for up to three years and I don't notice any change in flavor or quality. It could have lost some nutrient value, I don't know, um, but I, I've not noticed a change in the quality of it. But technically if your seal is still intact, your food is still edible. The other issue that comes up a lot is using your canner on smooth cooktops or on portable burners. And I was just reading what the National Center for Home Food Preservation has to say about that. Their stance is you should always check with the manufacturer of your stove. Um, I have a gas stove, it's not an issue for me, but if you have a ceramic top or a glass top 
cook stove, you need to check with your manufacturer. You also should check with the canner that you're purchasing because sometimes the canners are not flat enough on the bottom or the way the bottom of them is made. It will not allow the uh, heat to penetrate the canner correctly. So I guess a good guideline on that is to just always check with your stove manufacturer and make sure that it is safe to use for canning. Um, same thing for portable burners. Some people who have glass top um, and flat top stoves will use a portable burner instead. I was just reading on the National Center for Home Food Preservation that those can be unsafe as well. So you need to make sure that if you're gonna use a portable burner that it is um, approved for canning. Some of them can't take the weight of the canner so it can be a problem. So just make sure that you read the instructions and read the, the manufacturer's recommendations and make sure that it is approved for canning. Okay, now this is a question that I get a lot and this is important to know. What can I not can? What is not safe for home canning? That all fats, including mayonnaise, lard, and oil, except for small amounts included in a tested recipe. You will see some recipes that will use a tiny bit of butter or a tiny bit of olive oil. Um, as long as it's a tested recipe from a trusted source like the National Center for Home Food Preservation or ball canning, that's fine. But most of the time, fats cannot be used, no butter no, and no fatty cuts of meat. So if you're canning meat, you need to make sure that you're trimming the fat. No dairy, including milk, cheese, sour cream, whipping cream, yogurt, buttermilk, tofu, soy, or coconut milk. Eggs, don't can eggs. Grains, including oats, wheat, rice, barley, oatmeal, and bread. Pasta and noodles, that stands to reason they're usually made with grains and dairy. Mashed potatoes and meats. Mashed potatoes, um, I'm sorry, mashed vegetables and meats. Mashed potatoes, pumpkin pie filling, liver pate, giblets and pureed soup. So anything mashed or pureed, you shouldn't can it. Thickeners, including flour, tapioca, cornstarch, cornmeal, and arrowroot. Now there is a modified cornstarch called clear gel that is approved for canning, but it is only approved for water bath canning. I had this question a week or so ago and I did some quick research on uh, clear gel and it has so far has not been approved for pressure canning. It's only approved for using in jams, jellies, and pie filling, which is water bath canned. Um, don't can creamy dishes, including put pudding, refried beans, peanut butter, and pesto. Refried beans, people love them, and the way that I have overcome that is just can your beans the way you want them seasoned, and then when they come out of the jar, then you can um, mash them up to the refried bean texture that you like. So do not can them in the state of being refried beans. Um, Sage, this is one herb that turns bitter tasting when canned, so you probably shouldn't can with it. And dry beans that have not been previously soaked, this is a huge issue, especially on YouTube and around the internet. People love to argue this point, but it is really important to soak your beans. Beans are not approved for canning in a dried state. You will come across people who just throw dried beans in a jar and then add liquid and can them. That is not safe, so please don't do that. Um, and I have a video on that and I will include the link below so you can back can go back and watch that and I discuss all the reasons why you shouldn't do that. Um, they need to be soaked to reduce the phytic acid levels in them and then partially cooked before canning. That's the rule with dried beans and nothing else is considered safe. So if you see that, I highly recommend not following uh, that recipe. Okay guys, that's pretty much the basics of canning. I know it seems like a lot of information, and it kind of is, but it's really, it's really not too much once you break it down. Um, it, and it's very doable at home. Like I said, canning is just following a set of guidelines and knowing the rules and following the, the correct procedure each time you have a canning session, and it's not hard. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to go over is I just wanted to mention a few things, just a few of the canning books that I recommend so that if you are new, you kind of know where to start. I talked about the Amish canning book. This is a fantastic book. It has so much, it's just a gem of information. I, I just thoroughly love this book. 
Um, and then the other one that I have that I refer to all the time is the Ball Blue Book. This has been around for a long time. These are tested recipes, but like I said, Ball has a number of canning books, but this one is pretty good for beginners. I would say my favorite is the Amish canning book for beginners. That is where I would start. Well worth the investment. Um, this one I use, you'll see this on my channel a lot. I use this one a lot, the all new ball book of canning. This has some great recipes in it. Obviously it talks about the ins and outs of canning, but I don't think it's great for beginners. There's lots of information. There's information that you should know that is not included in this book. I'll say it that way. So um, I really, really like the Amish canning book. She really covers a lot of important things in that book. So that is for a new person, hands down, that would be my recommendation. Um, other sources, if you don't want to invest in a canning book, you can always find all the information you need on the National Center for Home Food Preservation. They have all kinds of questions there. They have um, all kinds of outlines with all of the guidelines and all the information that you need. They have tested recipes, so that is a terrific resource. Healthycanning.com, I love that resource. They share a lot of great recipes, plus they talk about all the scientific reasons for the guidelines and the ins and outs of canning. It is very, that, web, that website is extremely thorough. Um, the USDA has a, um, a canning guideline um, book, if you will. It's a PDF that you can download for free. It has a lot of information in it. It has some canning recipes in it as well. And your extension offices. Use your local extension office or there are others around the United States that you can use um, that have recipes and have all of the information you need to understand what you need to know about canning. So I will leave links for you um, in the description box below linking all of these things for you. I will leave you links for the canner that I use, the tools that I use, the jars that I use. There are lots of online resources that are tested, trusted, and approved resources so there's no reason to not get started with canning. So. Also, if you ever have any questions, you guys, please feel free to leave them for me in the comment section. I also have a website, thriftychichousewife.com. You can message me through my website. You can also hop on to Facebook, my Facebook page, Thrifty Chic Housewife, and you can private message me there with questions. Um, I'm here to help you. I love canning. I love answering your questions. And, um, so don't be free, don't be afraid to contact me. I'm happy, happy, happy to help you. So thanks so much for stopping by today, guys. I hope this encourages you on your canning journey and I will see you next time. Have a great day.